This is Francis Westbrook, a staff member, interviewing Earl Cook, a veteran of World War II. Mr. Cook, would you please begin by giving me your current address and your birth date? And I was born on October the 15th, 1919. Where were you before World War II started? I was at Georgia Tech, and I got my uh, commission as a second lieutenant. And in August of 41, all commissioned officers were called to active duty. And I went to, uh, was called down to uh, Camp Stewart, Georgia at that time. And later went to uh, maneuvers up in uh, North Carolina. And then uh, from there I went to the Fort Wadsworth in New York, and there is where I uh, was sent immediately in, in uh, January after, in 1942 to uh, the Pacific. And I was there in the Pacific for three and a half years. And uh, we were, I was with the Signal Corps. I went to... Uh, First, when I went overseas with a group of signal repairmen, we repaired uh, switchboards and radios and telephone gear and things like that. And then after we were in uh, Australia and uh, New Caledonia, I was transferred to a signal company, which later became part of the AmeriCal Infantry Division. The Marikal Infantry Division was one of the, the, the only division that was given a name instead of a number. It was uh, named for Americans in Caledonia. That's how Marikal came about. In fact, uh, one of the sergeants in my company uh, suggested that name, and General Alexander Patch, who was our uh, general at that time, he accepted that, and we were known as the Americal Division ever since. And then, uh, shall I go on with travels? We went to Australia about uh, two weeks, not knowing where we were going. We didn't know where we were going when we left the uh, New York Brooklyn Navy Yard in January of '42. We came down the east coast of the United States through the Panama Canal which I'll always remember that there were barrage balloons all over the canal at that time, great big balloons suspended by cables to protect the uh, canal. And then for 39 days, we zigzagged across the Pacific, not knowing where, well, we, during the time we finally found out that we were going to Australia. And we landed in Melbourne, Australia, and uh, we disembarked, and my unit went to a little central park there, and we camped for about two weeks there. Then we were uh, told to reload and get ready to go again, not knowing where we were going. But, I mean, those junior officers like me didn't know where we were going. But we ended up in New Caledonia, which is an island east of Australia. And we went to New Caledonia as uh, the first troops into New Caledonia after the war had started. And uh, of course, uh, the war was underway when we left New York in January after the previous December the 7th uh, Pearl Harbor incident. And the New Caledonia people were very friendly. It's a French possession. It still is today. It was a French possession that uh, the people there mostly welcomed us because they felt like that uh, the American troops had uh, come to keep them from being uh, invaded by the Japanese because New Caledonia is a very strategic location. If you look at the map, it shows, uh, it shows you how the, uh, the, the route from Japan down toward New, uh, Australia, New Caledonia was in a very good position to block any, any of that uh, 
uh, effort by the Japanese. So we were there for, oh, some six months, accompanied by a lot of Navy and other uh, military units. The Navy had a big base there in Numir, the capital. It had a big uh, harbor there, and there were huge numbers of, of Navy ships and Air Force uh, people there to big airfield that was north of the city of New Mir. But after we'd been there for a while, uh, we were, my, my small unit was com repairing uh, uh, signal equipment for all branches of the service, including the Navy at times. And so then, uh, after a while, I was transferred to the signal company that was there with that uh, task force. And uh, later on, when we did, decided to establish that division, the Marical, the signal company, I became a part of the signal company and <clears throat> was uh, part of it when we left New Caledonia and went to Guadalcanal. We went into Guadalcanal <clears throat> after the Marines initially landed there. And the Marines uh, had some tough fighting there, but. They didn't have all the tough fighting. Our, our division also had tough fighting with our three infantry regiments with artillery and engineers and quartermaster and all the different uh, branches of the service that, that are needed in order to make a uh, successful operation. The uh, life on Guadalcanal at that time with the Japanese uh, bringing in reinforcements and, and uh, being uh, generally uh, worrisome as far as shelling us. And one of the things I remember most about being on Guadalcanal was the, the nights. Uh, of course, we all had foxholes. They would, we dug down in the sand and cut coconut trees and laid them across the foxhole to make it uh, safe for us in case of bombardments and bombs dropping, which they did. And one of the things that bothered us most though there was the Japanese would send over one or maybe two relatively small bombers at night. And of course you never knew when they were going to drop a bomb. And if they did drop a bomb, of course uh, uh, you never knew where it was going to hit. So everybody felt like they had to be in a in a foxhole, and so that's what happened. They would come across the island, and we would have to stay awake and not get a good night's sleep, and the next day we would be drowsy and going about our work the next day when the hot, humid weather rained about every day. But anyway, we, we lived through it, and uh, after about four months there on, on Guadalcanal, we were... Uh, able to be relieved and we went to the island of Fiji or the islands of Fiji for rest and recuperation and regrouping and getting replacements and many of us had to get well from malaria which we had there due to the mosquitoes. Of course we all slept on the mosquito netting and we all took a, a, a drug called Adabrin which was to keep us from getting malaria at least to make it a, not such a bad case of it. But uh, the funny thing about this adamant, it turned our, our skin and our faces yellow. We, we looked almost as yellow as our <laughs> adversaries. <laughs> but anyway, in, in uh, New Caledonia, I mean in uh, Fiji, we had a relatively <clears throat> easy time there of <clears throat> getting uh, new getting supplies and getting rested up a little bit, getting replacements for those who had been evacuated from Guadalcanal. And then the time came that uh, we needed to um, be sent up to Bougainville, the island of Bougainville. And at Bougainville, we did the same kind of operation that we did on Guadalcanal. We followed the Marines there and uh, we the Marines did not encounter all the resistance there. There was plenty left for us to do. The, 
uh, our infantry battalions and, and artillery were, was busy uh, trying to uh, uh, get the uh, Japanese cleared out of the island and eventually they were able to take over with other help from the Navy and Marines and, and Air Force, uh, the Army Air Corps at that time it was called, it wasn't really the Air Force as we know it today. So after Bougainville, instead of getting a chance to go rest, we were sent up to the Philippines and we landed at Leyte, one of the island groups in the Philippines. <clears throat> and some of our units there were spread out throughout the, that area. One unit went down to the island of Cebu where there was Japanese resistance. And uh, so they uh, were able to uh, do a good job of effectively cleaning up uh, the resistance there at, uh, in the Philippines. But by this time, as far as I was concerned, three and a half years had passed. What I've just described was three and a half years of my life. And by that time in the Philippines, I had enough what they call points. You get points for how long you'd been over there and so forth. I had enough points <clears throat> to be uh, rotated back to the United States. And I came back uh, in April of 1945, the day that Franklin Roosevelt died, in fact. I was in San Francisco that day. Um, I don't know if this would be of interest, but I have a map here that just kind of shows those three and a half years here. I, I don't know if it'll show up or not, but uh, this map is a map of my travels over there. And uh, it starts here in uh, January of 1942 at the Panama Canal. And then 39 days across the Pacific where we were zigzagging to avoid Japanese submarines. And finally, after 39 days of that, we landed in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, there's where we stayed for about two weeks then we reloaded on our ships and the convoy of ships. There were about 15 big uh, troop transports there, not troop transports. Uh, they weren't designed for that, but they were cruise ships that were converted to troop transports, most of them. And we went over here to New Caledonia, which I mentioned earlier, and stayed there about four months. And after New Caledonia, uh, we uh, went to Guadalcanal here and after Guadalcanal, we went down to Fiji here. And after Fiji, we then we went up to Bougainville. And from Bougainville, we went up to the Philippines. And that's where I was able to come home from the Philippines and we were able to go directly to uh, San Francisco the, in April of 1945. So that was, uh, that was my itinerary during World War II. After uh, our return to uh, the States in 1945, uh, I was assigned to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey to the Signal Corps Board. And our duties there were to uh, test uh, signal equipment that was being developed by the Signal Corps laboratories and all kinds of uh, organizations, uh, AT&T, Bell Laboratories, and other companies who were designing and uh, coming up with new ideas for signal equipment. They, uh, we, we tested new types of radios that we used out in the Pacific. Unfortunately, some of the radios we had out in the Pacific didn't uh, operate too well with the humidity that we had there. It was very, very humid all the time. In fact, the whole, whole, the whole time I was out in the Pacific, uh, I was never further down than 15 degrees of, of uh, latitude. And uh, so I, I never knew what it was to be cold out there. We never needed any, any cold weather gear. We needed raincoats, <laughs> but anyway, we got able to, we were able to, uh, get by pretty good. The uh, Signal Corps board uh, work, uh, we, we tested things like uh, underwater cables, uh, 
cables that we use for telephone uh, communications, which we, well, during the time we were there, we had to string the the cables from coconut trees when instead of telephone poles with so many coconut trees there, we were able to use them for poles. And we had to devise means to attach the wires to the coconut trees in such a way that they would stand uh, shelling and, and any uh, other activities that would break the wires, which frequently it, it happened. So uh, <clears throat> that was what we were doing at the Signal Corps board. And uh, it, as far as I know, it's still in operation doing similar type things. I suppose it was, to the Signal Corps, it was somewhat like uh, the Bell Laboratories to the Bell System, which I was a part of and after the war. And they were constantly involved in testing and devising new uh, uh, means of communication and improving on the existing uh, communication items that we used at, during the war at that time. So that, I think, brings me to uh, the time when uh, the, uh, the war was over already in Germany and then it was over in Japan and I finally was able to uh, be uh, discharged as a major in the Signal Corps and 1945, April 1945. Great, thank you. Could you tell me what you remember about the day Roosevelt died when you had returned to the United States? What I, reaction I'll always remember that because uh, pretty soon after we landed in uh, San Francisco, uh, we were taken to some barracks on Angel Island at that time. And uh, Unfortunately for me, I was assigned as to be the train commander for a troop train bringing back veterans from San Francisco to all across the country. And I was a train commander. And <laughs> I guess I was a senior officer of that group. That's the reason I got that uh, honorable title. <laughs> but it was an interesting experience on the train because here we were with about, I guess there must have been 20 cars on the train loaded with troops and it was a, a steam engine pull. The train was pulled by a steam engine belching out smoke and cinders on non-air conditioned cars and uh, it wasn't summertime fortunately but it was not cool either. So we had our share of uh, soot and, and uh, dust and so forth. But the thing I remember most about uh, leaving San Francisco on that day was of course we were all stunned by the news of Roosevelt's death and being from Georgia knowing that he died in Warm Springs you know it kind of came close to home to us but to those of us from Georgia of course most of us were from all they were all over the country that were on that train so we left San Francisco and headed uh, east and we would stop along the way to let soldiers that were destined to go to other places, you know, like in Nevada and uh, the uh, states that we passed through, they would be taken off and go to camps to be discharged. One thing about it was those uh, soldiers who'd been over in the Pacific for three years did not have much a activity, didn't have any, any uh, opportunity to get a glass of beer or a can of beer or a bottle of beer at those times. And so when the train would stop to take on water at these water stations, you know, the steam engine had to pick up water every now and then. These guys would get off the train as much as we tried to keep them on the train. And they would go and get a can of beer somewhere or get several cans. And One time, <clears throat> one of our troops got up in the cab of the steam engine and he was helping shoveling coal into the <laughs> furnace of the, of the engine and they called me and said, Captain, I was a captain at that time, he said, you gotta come get this man. We can't keep him up here and then running the train. So we had to go get him and put him back into a place where he could keep him uh, off, the, off the engine. That was just a small thing, but 
we had to feed the men. I mean, this was about a five-day trip, and we had to, we had kitchens on the train to feed us. Oh, I guess we had two meals a day. Well, when you got back to Atlanta, had the funeral already taken place? Roosevelt's funeral. Do you remember that happening? <clears throat> His funeral train. I don't remember that. Uh, when I came back, I, got, we, I ended up at Fort McPherson. That was where I was able to be relieved of my duty as train commander at Fort McPherson. And then uh, I had two weeks leave. And I, at the moment, I don't remember where I was when the funeral train came through Atlanta. Of course, I've seen pictures and know about it. But if the thing was, you know, that all of us felt, and I particularly felt, was so glad to be home alive and able to see my family after three and a half years. My father died while I was out in the Pacific and of course I was not home at that time. But uh, soon after my two weeks at home, I was sent down to um, Miami to a rest area down there where we were debriefed, I guess you would call it, but we had some good, uh, rehabilitation times down there and then I was from there I was assigned to this position on the Signal Corps board in Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. I see. What were some, your family was here in Atlanta then? Yes. What were some of the experiences you remember the people back at home went through? What was the mail like? And anything specific about the home front? Well, to those of us who were over in the Pacific, uh, of course, we had no telephones, no cell phones, no satellite service back in those days, no television. Uh, but uh, coming back home, uh, I remember the streetcars in Atlanta that we all see pictures of and many of us remember. Uh, I believe rationing was still in effect at that time. Uh, I know I, our family had not had as much gasoline as they would have liked to have had. Uh, and I remember uh, I was able to buy a used car, and I drove that car to my assignment up in New Jersey. And I think I had somehow was given extra gasoline rations or something. I don't, I don't ever remember being a, it being a problem. But I do know that my family and, and others had a problem while I was away. Were you able to get and receive the mail? Our mail service out in the Pacific was not very good. For instance, uh, I did not know my father died until four weeks after he died. Uh, the V-mail service was was okay, but it was not as efficient mm -hmm. as I, I mean it, it was not it was better from the standpoint of it uh, could be handled faster, I guess, than our letters. Mm -hmm. But uh, we we did not use V-mail. Too much. I'm, I don't think my family used it. They, I think they were thinking about writing me letters, which, yes. which I got letters, Good. but uh, they were so uh, few and far between as far as the delivery and receipt. Right. Do you still have some of the letters your family sent to you? Uh, I think I do, but my family kept every letter that I wrote. I've got them at home now. Well, they're available. Good. That would be very <clears throat> They were censored, of course. Yes. Well, of course, we officers were able to censor our own mail. So that was Good. not that I, I don't think I disclosed any right. military secrets at the time. Right. <laughs> what about the dropping of the bombs in, in Japan? Do you remember that distinctly in your reactions? You I remember... Uh, when the bomb was dropped on in Japan, uh, it was somewhat of a surprise, of course, because those of us 
99% of us knew nothing about it, I don't think, that there was such a thing available. But uh, I, I guess I was, my feeling was that I felt sorry for the many thousands of people that were killed. It was, it was terrible. But on the other hand, I have often said, and, and, and others of us have said the same thing, that had the bombs not been dropped on Japan, we might not have been here talking today about it. We might have been uh, in the force that was trying to evade, invade Japan, and we knew then, and we found out more later, that they were ready to die to the last man of any invasion. And as bad as it was, and I'm, I know that many people today say that we shouldn't have dropped the bombs, but those of us that were around at the time feel like it was necessary to bring the war to a close. And I guess we'd have to say we were grateful that we were able to come back and those uh, bombs made it possible for many of us. So, would you like well, to talk about some of your outstanding memories of the entire period? Any one or two things particularly stand out for you? Oh, let's see. Uh, back to the bombing of, on, say, on Guadalcanal and Bougainville. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the Japanese would drop one or two bomb, bomb, small bombs at it was small if, if the, compared to the big ones, but I know one night <clears throat> I was in the foxhole that would have a red alert, a long, red alarm, and we'd all go to our foxholes and say in the middle of the night, and then you would hear this little Japanese bomber plane buzzing around over the island, and he'd drop a bomb or two, and one night he dropped one near our camp, and uh, we were living in what was known as pyramidal tents, the, the, uh, tents rather. They were uh, like ordinary tents that we see today. And they were made out of very heavy uh, canvas. And when, I, when the air raid was over, I went back to my bunk. And on my bunk, under the mosquito, it had come through the tent, through the mosquito netting, and down on the bunk where I would be laying. And this jagged looking piece of shrapnel was lying right where I would have been. And I still have that piece of shrapnel. Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. Well, it, we want to see that, too. Well, you're welcome to it. That's amazing. Just amazing. Uh, I guess uh, other things I remember, we were on troop ships a good deal, going from island to island and so forth. And uh, in fact, going back from the Philippines to San Francisco, uh, one of the uh, members on the ship died and uh, he was buried at sea, which uh, I thought was I interesting and the body was put on a plank and slid over the yeah. over to the, in the ocean. Uh, the, excuse me, go ahead. Then uh, this is off the subject I guess, but when we went over, there's a a custom of when you go across the equator that there's always kind of a little, on any ship, I think, as cruise ships today may have something similar to that, but they have a, a ceremony that in, initiates you into D Davy Jones' locker. And so uh, they took several of us and uh, they uh, would dunk us in the water and put some crazy stuff on us and. <laughs> I don't know, molasses or some yeah. crazy stuff. And then we all got a uh, 
certificate saying that we had been inducted into David Jones locker. So I think I still got that certificate, but I'm sure many others have that similar thing. Oh, uh, let's see. I guess another thing about traveling on those ships <clears throat> was uh, the there were cruise ships. So, well, not all of them, I guess, were cruise ships that had been uh, outfitted for troop use. And uh, we uh, were crowded in there. The, the officers were crowded, and, and the enlisted men were uh, crowded too. But... Uh, we were in bunks, canvas bunks, kind of. They weren't. Uh, uh, they weren't those uh, swinging things that you see in sometimes in navy ships. They were just canvas bunks, and they were four that high. And uh, it was uh, not very pleasant to sleep. Thirty-nine days again, and. Uh, we had to take the showers were salt water showers, um, and we'd have an occasion to get out on the deck to get some fresh air. But there were occasionally uh, times when uh, we were uh, on the alert for submarines, and some of the escort vessels would drop depth bombs and uh, be these big explosions of uh, water jumping up in the off the surface, but uh, actually none of the ships that I was on or none of the uh, the uh, convoys that I was on was lost due to Japanese action, fortunately. Did you have anything you kept with you for good luck? Did you have any little superstition or something special you did other than pray? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think I had any rabbit's feet or anything like that, but uh, we all were very aware that at any time uh, we could have been blown up, you know, that whole time. You never knew because the uh, Japanese were all over the Pacific with their submarines. And, uh, of course, uh, we had uh, chapel services uh, Periodically, there were chaplains, of course, in our units, and many of us uh, attended these services. I remember back on Bougainville on Christmas Day, uh, we had a small uh, Protestant chapel service there under a little fly, a little tent. And I never will forget that this service was going on at the same time in the background you could hear our artillery firing shells at the uh, Japanese and vice versa, I guess. So uh, we uh, we had uh, tough times there with uh, those those things happening, and there were better times. Uh, Bob Hope and company came and entertained us, uh, and uh, eventually we were able to have movies that were shipped out and many a times we would see movies, we'd find a place in our camp, after, particularly in say in, in Fiji, we were able to set up kind of a kind of a stage and on a sloping place there and our troops would come out and sit on the slope and we'd show the movie. And uh, we didn't have any trouble with doing that in uh, New Caledonia, but in, uh, well, I guess we never saw a move in Guadalcanal, but I think we, on Bougainville, we might have been able to see a movie or two, but at times when uh, you're showing the movie, and if we got an air raid alarm where everybody would have to leave, and the movie would be over right away, and we'd all go to our foxholes. So... Uh, and unfortunately, we at that time, I'm sure that today the the services have access to all kinds of uh, good uh, communication and recreation facilities, which we didn't have at that time because uh, we could not get uh, clear broadcasts from the United States. 
I remember being in the Signal Corps, I had access to shortwave radios. And, and I remember listening to uh, uh, the Radio Tokyo with uh, Tokyo Rose. Uh, you may have heard of her. She was broadcasting, uh, telling us that we were about to be uh, invaded on Guadalcanal and Bougainville and it wouldn't be much longer that we would be able to stay there safely. And at the same time, we knew the Japanese were just about gone and we, didn't, we knew that that was all a lot of propaganda. But one thing I got a kick out of, one time I was listening to the news from San Francisco, a shortwave station in San Francisco, and they were telling about what the Marines were doing on Guadalcanal, and, and uh, I knew <laughs> the Marines had all gone, but a few people that were left in uh, our American Infantry Division was doing all the dirty work there, but the Marines must have had a better a public relations group than we did at that time. <laughs> I've often told my Marines, my Marine, fr my Marine friends about that. Another interesting thing, uh, this is much later than this, um, in 1992, 50 years exactly from the time we landed on Guadalcanal, or the Marines landed on Guadalcanal, I was not among the first that landed, but uh, many of us contributed to a memorial fund to build a memorial on Guadalcanal to those people who served, military people who served on Guadalcanal, all branches of the service. And we, uh, my wife and I and many others, about I suspect there were about a, a thousand of us, went back to Guadalcanal on, on uh, August the 7th, 1992 to dedicate this memorial there <coughs> to the uh, military people who served there. <coughs> it was a very impressive ceremony, and uh, that, memo that memorial still stands there. Uh, the uh, island of Guadalcanal is very much uh, a part of the Japanese industry now. Uh, when we went back there in 1992, the Japanese owned the mo little motel that we stayed in. Of course, when we were there, there was nothing there but palm trees and things like that and jungle. Since that time, uh, in 50 years, they have, the Japanese have been very active there from an industrial standpoint. They have big uh, fishing fleets there that catch fish and, and can the fish and on big ships, freezers, and so forth. And uh, so that was a very <clears throat> interesting trip. On that trip, by the way, was <clears throat> Marine General Raymond Davis from Stockbridge down here, who just recently died. He was uh, with us there on that occasion. In fact, he made uh, an address, uh, that he made an address for uh, President Bush, who couldn't be there, and he uh, represented President Bush at this ceremony. General Davis, by the way, is an alumna of the Tech High, Tech High School here in Atlanta, which I was an alumna, and he was also an alumna of uh, Georgia Tech, of which I am a Georgia Tech alumna. So, I've seen him on a number of occasions in, in recent years at those occasions at Georgia Tech and Tech High School. Mm -hmm. So, Would you like to talk about, you probably wouldn't like to talk about it, but I'd like to ask a little about your Bronze Star and your other awards. And how those well, the Bronze Star was the one I guess has more significance. Uh, on. Uh, Bougainville one time, uh, our job in the signal company was to provide communications from the division headquarters out to the units, uh, the infantry divisions, the artillery units, and so forth. And uh, at one occasion on, on Bougainville, we had uh, an infantry division unit up on the front lines 
that were without uh, wire communications. We had radio, but as I said, radio didn't always work well in the jungle. The, the moisture was bad on the sets themselves, and the jungle foliage was so thick that radios didn't always penetrate too well. And then another thing, uh, it was good to have wire communications because it was more secure than, than radio. But anyway, we had this infantry unit up there without any wire communications. And so I was designated to take a group of telephone men to establish wire lines up to this unit. And uh, we'd had a bad uh, rainstorm and there's a little river between us and them that we had to cross with the wire and there were snipers along the way that we were afraid that we might have some problems with them, but fortunately we were able to get through and establish this uh, wire communication to this unit. And uh, I thought nothing about it when we got back, but later on we were given a bronze star for what we did. But uh, it was just all in a day's work. We were glad to be able to do it. Did you keep a diary of all these experiences? Part of the time I kept a diary, but then we were discouraged and even prohibited from keeping diaries. And I do have uh, a diary for the time we, uh, I guess, when we were on, Guadal when we were on uh, New Caledonia and, and then when we went to Guadalcanal, but then we were, it was, we were decided, we were told that we could not keep diaries, which was right. We shouldn't have had them because if they had been captured by the Japanese, why, it would have been uh, some help to them, probably. Let's see. What else do you think I ought to talk about? If that, I think maybe uh, this is probably enough. Oh, Francis, I, I've often said, my wife has said the same thing and my other associates, that was the last war that we will ever be in, I guess, when we were, had the 100% backing of the United States. Uh, I don't think, well, I'm sure there are always some people who are against war under any conditions, but I think we in the military at that time felt that we were 100, we were backed up 100% by the American people. Uh, unfortunately, uh, later wars, Korea and Vietnam, we didn't have the backing that we had in World War II. And uh, I just felt like, uh, we felt like, I think, that we were really supported in that war. Oh, drives, oh yes. Rationing, yeah. Anything they could. I remember <clears throat> my wife tells a story. She was in the wax and stationed out at Camp Crowder, Missouri, and she had a leave one time and went to visit her aunt out in California in San Francisco and they took her down to Fishman's Wharf and uh thought it'd be great to give her a tour down there and ordered lunch and she got uh, ordered seafood, and she said to her aunt and her uncle, she says, oh, it's so great to be able to have something besides steak. <laughs> and the uncle and aunt said, what do you mean by that? Being out in the Midwest, they, were, they had a lot of steak out there. Of course, all over the country, people did not have steak, of course, but they were able to have steak at the, uh, in the uh, Missouri area, apparently. She said, it's so nice to be able to eat something besides steak. And they never could get over her That's saying that right. because they had, hadn't seen a steak in months and maybe years. Right. Now, did you meet your wife in connection with the service? No, no. We were friends before the war. Uh, we knew each other. We went to St. Mark Methodist Church here in Atlanta, Peachtree and Fifth Street. And we knew each other there before the war. And then... Uh, during the war, we corresponded just as friends, you know, occasionally, as 
best we could. She was a company commander of a WAC detachment at Camp Crowder, Missouri, which she'll tell you about in detail when you get to interview her. <laughs> and uh, so after the war, we came back to Atlanta and we, again, uh, so many of our former friends were gone or somewhere or other else. So she and I were among the, the few that were left of our old crew, so, so to speak. Uh, she was, uh, uh, at that time, was working at Rich's, and, and uh, so uh, she and I rekindled our friendship, and, oh, she was taking flying lessons out in the Pacific, uh, not, I mean, out, out in the, uh, at Camp Crowder, Missouri, not with the service uh, on a private. So she came back to Atlanta and continued taking flying lessons out at Candler Field at that time. And so she tells this story and she kind of embellishes it at times, but she says she took me up in, the, in a plane to give me a ride and said she got me over a cemetery out in College Park and told me that if I didn't propose, she was going to do a loop-de-loop. -loop. <laughs> so that's a kind of a story that's that great. she likes to tell. But anyway, we, we uh, got married in... Uh, June of 47. I went to work for Southern Bell at that time. And then we uh, moved to Valdosta, from Valdosta to Rome, from Rome to Atlanta, from Atlanta to New York with AT&T, from back from AT&T to Atlanta. Then I was transferred again to Macon, Georgia for the division job. And from Macon came back to Atlanta and then after all that, 33 years of a telephone company, I was finally retired, and <clears throat> so we have been retired since, oh, since 1980, I guess. It's a great, great career. So that's that's about my story, I think. It is. I'd like to ask a little about your wife's motivations for joining the service, but we'll wait until she comes and get into. She'll tell you that in uh, minute detail. Good. <laughs> she was teaching school here in Atlanta. Uh -huh. She graduated from Georgia State College for Women, GSCW, in, May in Milledgeville. She calls it, by the way, God's Secluded Corner for Women, which <laughs> she said they were so strict with them at that time. But she was teaching school here in Atlanta, and she felt like that uh, she needed a different challenge, and so... She told her family that she was going to join the first service that came along, and her family was aghast, of course. But the wax came along, and she joined the wax, and she went to Officer Kendit School, and then was made a first lieutenant, and then down to Camp Crowder, Missouri, where she spent the whole time, most of the time, and was promoted to captain, and she was in charge of the WAC detachment at uh, Camp Crowder, Missouri. And from there, she was able to be discharged as I was back in 1945, I believe. Very outstanding. Well, thank you. I'm going to turn this off for a moment, All right. and then we'll think if there's anything else. All right. Okay. Uh, some of the people I was associated with during the war that I kept up with following the war was being over. Well, first, back on Guadalcanal, this is a, a signal operations report that uh, was prepared by this division signal officer at that time in whose office I was working. And the signal officer at that time was Lieutenant Colonel Robert Beverly Habersham Rockwell. Good old Georgia name, good old Georgia uh, native. His home was in, he grew up in Savannah, and uh, he was in charge of our operations there, and he, he uh, with a lot of us worked to help him do this. These are instructions as to how the signal company maintained communications and furnished communications to the various units uh, in the uh, operation there on Guadalcanal. Uh, we had, uh, uh, had, uh, communications to three infantry 
regiments, uh, uh, four field artillery battalions, and quartermasters, engineers, uh, ordnance, the Baker unit, and uh, medical regiment, ordnance company, the uh, APO section, the finance detachment, and all these organizations that we provided communications to and uh, others uh, like Marines and Navy who had uh, operations there. But Colonel Rockwell and I were good friends there and also uh, following the uh, war. I kept up with him as he returned to Savannah and we would see each other often. Uh, as far as other people I kept up with during uh, after the war, it was uh, two lieutenants <clears throat> that were part of the signal company. They were natives of Massachusetts because it was a <clears throat> National Guard unit that we were with. Two lieutenants, <clears throat> Lieutenant Douglas Lehman and uh, Wal uh, Chief War Warrant Officer Walter Morse. And uh, both of them, unfortunately, are deceased. And I keep up with their widows uh, regularly, and uh, they seem to enjoy hearing from me and others that they knew of during that time. I have another friend who was with me during the uh, Bougainville and Philippine campaign, <clears throat> Lieutenant James Parnell. He was uh, subsequently promoted to captain and took over the signal company after I left over there. And he was with the uh, signal company until it was brought back to the United States and disbanded in uh, in Oregon in 1945, I believe it was. He lives in Columbia, Tennessee, and we've seen each other a number of times, and I keep up with him on, on telephone almost weekly now. We refight the war, and we, he was with a telephone company, and we all, we, we uh, decide that the telephone company hasn't been the same since he and I retired, so that was one connection we have. One other thing might be of interest, back to, <clears throat> to Fiji, uh, I've shown this a number of times to people and seem to be interested in it. The natives in Fiji beat the bark of certain trees. They wet it and beat it and beat it and beat it until it comes out to something like, it's almost like paper. And they decorate it like this. And it's called tapa cloth, T-A-P-A. And they make these designs and color it with various uh, colored berries or uh, uh, clay that they, uh, some sort of clay that they use. And it's done by hand. Now this one, I got this one in 1992 when we went back over there to dedicate that memorial on Guadalcanal and we stopped in Fiji again. And they are selling these now as a, souvenirs for tourists. I think this one is probably made mostly by machine, but I do have one at home that's made, I know, by hand. So those are things that uh, we picked up along the way. And also another thing that uh, we keep in touch with each other, this, the Americal Division has a newsletter that uh, we get uh, periodically. And then there's a the Guadalcanal Echoes is published by uh, Guadalcanal campaign veterans. And by the way, we, uh, we are going down in, in number. Uh, there will be a time when there won't be any of us left that are members of this organization. But we keep up with a number of our friends through these publications, and it's good to know what some of them are doing, unfortunately. More and more of them are, are not with us anymore. 1,500 a day are dying. But I think that's about all I can tell you. And Do you want to say a word or two for the next generation? Well, as I've said previously, I'm afraid that there won't be any more wars that the, our country will be involved in where we will have the support that we had in World War II. And I, of course, I would hope that we wouldn't have any more wars, but it seems that this it inevitable that the way uh, our civilization goes, that we have to get engaged in 
in military activity from time to time, and it's terrible that we have to do that, but uh, I hope that we all will s support our military because uh, we, our country needs a strong military, and it deserves the support of all of us, and I hope it will always be that way. I'm delighted to participate in this program, and I hope that one of these days that uh, people will look back and maybe learn something from these uh, experiences that we've had, and I appreciate being invited to do this. <laughs>